I didn't know it at the time, but I was smitten by things Italian when I was 11 years old. I thought she was just a pretty girl. Her skin was olive, her hair dark, her figure slender, her face divine. One hot August day, she lured her best friend's cousin under the low-hanging branches of an apple tree on the pretense that the coolest and sweetest fruit was to be found there. She then proceeded to teach that impressionable young boy how to kiss. Not a May Day basket peck of a kiss, but a real kiss. A wet, chills-down-the-back-of-your-neck kind of kiss. I didn't tell Dad about the kiss, but I did ask him about Kathy. He was the one who told me she was Italian. Her brother Rossi was my best friend and always had been. Dad told me that he was Italian, too. Their mother and father owned my favorite restaurant. I guess I didn't know they were Italian because they didn't advertise their Italianness. <laughs> they didn't advertise anything. They just served good meals and called the place White Cafe. I loved their food. I loved that whole family. I especially loved the times that they invited me to join them for Sunday dinner at their home. They seemed more like a family than mine. I didn't know exactly what I meant by that or why I loved it, but I sure knew what being with that family felt like. Back then, I attached little significance to the fact that they were Italian. <laughs> when you're a kid, things just are. You don't question how they got that way. Many years ago, there lived a well-loved Jewish sage named Rabbi Zusha, Rabbi Zusha was renowned throughout the world for his gifted insights as a scholar, a teacher, and a healer. When the time came for Rabbi Zusha to leave this world, his students gathered at his bedside. During a tender moment, the rabbi began to weep. Why do you cry, rabbi? asked one of the disciples. If anyone is assured a place in heaven, it is you. You are one of the greatest and most revered spiritual teachers in the world. Rabbi Zusha turned his head softly toward the one who spoke and looked him in the eye. His gaze was piercing, as one who could see through this world to another. I will tell you why I weep, my dear one. If when I approach the gates of heaven, the angel who meets me asks, Why were you not a Moses? I shall answer with conviction, because I was not born to be a Moses. And if the angel challenges me, but neither did you perform the feats that Elijah did, I shall firmly respond, my mission was not the same one that Elijah was sent to accomplish. But there is one question that I fear being unable to answer. Why were you not a Rabbi Zusha? Here are the seven keys of awakening. The practices and rituals you will find here are doorways that reveal the inherent beauty and meaning of our ordinary moments. One. Say yes to life in all its erotic passion. 2. Go with the flow of the life force within and all around you. 3. Trust yourself and allow your personal power to manifest in life. 4. Open your heart in loving compassion to the self and to others. 5. Authentically express your creativity and your truth. 6. Look within to achieve clarity and insight in your life. 7. Surrender to your source and no gratitude, spiritual peace, and the new capacity to live at the maximum potential in every moment. These seven keys can open us up to our essential selves and unleash in us that abundant, joyous energy that allows us to be all that we can be as human beings. The Indians, who had an innate sense of color and decoration, painted their faces, originally at least, to protect themselves from the wind, the sun, the snow, and especially from insect bites. This paint, wrongfully called war paint, did not always have a direct connection with warfare. It was, above all, personal painting, medicine for war, for the hunt, and to indicate the rank and merits of the Indians who wore it. 
as well as for numerous religious ceremonies. The Indian was, in fact, a very religious being, especially attracted to the spirit world.